Uh, it's a, an honor for me to be back at the library, of course. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I love the library and the community so much. I think that this is the greatest presidential library in the country, and it's all because of you and because of our great staff here. So thank you very much. And I think it's, tonight is particularly exciting because we have a wonderful guest, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> so much fun to introduce him. So uh, Tucker has had an extraordinary career. He's had a meteoric rise uh, from a fact checker for a conservative newspaper to writing for the Weekly Standard. Uh, then he took a little detour where he uh, worked at CNN and uh, MSNBC. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> we, for, we forgive him for working for the fake news media. <laughs> because then he came back to the fold and went to Fox News in 2009. <clears throat> of course, in the meantime, he had a little detour to Dancing with the Stars, so... We'll at least give him kudos for trying something new on national TV. So that's very good. <laughs> but, of course, uh, today, Tucker hosts uh, the show Tucker at the 8 p.m. Uh, hour uh, that was uh, Bill O'Reilly's old hour on Fox News and uh, he's doing a fantastic job. Uh, he's uh, winning the ratings war there and he has a great new book out and uh, I have read it, Ship of Fools. It is a fantastic book. If you want to understand the rise of President Trump, you need to read this book. I would buy this book immediately because we need to keep Tucker on top of the best sellers list, the New York Times best sellers list. And what is particularly gratifying is that he knocked Bob Woodward off of the best sellers list. So I, I, I don't want to take up too much time because we all want to hear from Tucker, but this book is really extraordinary. It really talks about how for decades the American political elite on both sides of the aisle have let down the American people, whether it's on immigration, whether it's on the opioid crisis that is affecting our country, uh, whether it's on foreign policy uh, with wars in Libya and Yemen and other places where uh, we've had ill-advised wars. Tucker's book really goes to the core of what was rotten in America, and the rotten part of America was with America's political elite. And this is what the electorate in 2016 was voting against. They said, we want someone different. And that's why we have President Donald Trump today as our president. So this, this is going to be an exciting book. Uh, it's great on many levels, but on a personal level, I think it was very interesting to see Tucker take on the sacred cows of the liberal elitist left, whether it's Chelsea Clinton or Todd Nahisi Coates, who I'm sure we're going to have some great stories about tonight. It was exciting to read Tucker's takedown of these uh, liberals who feel that the world owes them so much. So it was really, really a wonderful thing to see that in his book. So I think we're going to have an exciting night tonight. I can't wait to hear Tucker speak. Let's give Tucker Carlson a warm round of applause and welcome him to the podium. Woo! Unbelievable. Thank you. I, th this is more the California I grew up in. And so I. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I don't think I've ever had an introduction like that, so I, I'm grateful for it. It's always such a poignant experience to come back to the state, which obviously produced me um, and which I loved. And, you know, it's, it's changed in a lot of ways, but then I come here and I'm like, no, no, no. This is exactly the group of people I grew up around. And so you just make me feel so much better. You have no, it's, you have no idea. No, I'm, I'm sincere. Um, and by the way, this library is remarkable. I've never been here before. Whenever I'm in, I know, I'm either, I grew up in Los Angeles and then La Jolla, 
Um, and so when I'm here, I'm in one of those two places or out in the desert or something. But I have never been here, and I was just, I was kind of stunned by it, actually. And also stunned um, by what I'd missed about the Nixon presidency. So my first memory of my life, actually, that I remember was sitting in our kitchen in Los Angeles watching in the summer of 1974, I was five, uh, the president resign. And so that, and that kind of defined what I thought of the presidency, I guess. And as much as I spend my entire life trying to resist buying into or internalizing these absurd storylines that are presented to me, the propaganda that bombards us constantly, it's hard not to kind of internalize some of it, if you know what I mean. If, you know, if you're swimming in a bath full of food coloring, you're going to come out that color, kind of, is the truth. <laughs> and, you know, I'm 49 years old. It had never occurred to me a single time to think about everything that happened during the Nixon presidency. I mean, not major stuff, but just like, you know, ending the Vietnam War. <laughs> or, you know, stuff like that, or putting a man on the moon, just the kind of parenthetical things uh, that happened. You know, or opening up China to the world. And I thought of the administrations I've covered breathlessly, you know, as if this was really significant stuff. I covered the 1996 Dole versus Clinton election. I can't remember who won, actually. That's, I mean, because time really does put things into perspective. And you sort of wake up one morning and you're like, well, why was I so mad about that? Or why did I think that was so very important? at the time. And the truth is, it's almost always because everyone around you who talks loudest was saying it was the most important thing. And even if you think for yourself, if you're an independent thinker, you end up kind of believing it, I guess. And that's why propaganda still exists, because it works. So if you live in a world where everybody on every channel is like, Russia! <laughs> even if you think it's stupid, after a while, you begin to think that Russia is somehow relevant to something, which, of course, it's not. And in 30 years, I think the rest of us will be sitting around having a drink in our old age saying, what was that? Remember that Russia thing? That was insane, actually. <laughs> I'm not waiting 30 years. I'm saying that now. Dead sober. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, I, I couldn't be more grateful to be here. This is Warren, this long book tour. This is just a, is a respite. This is a, this is a spa treatment for me. Uh, I know, in a wholesome, fully clothed way, but I mean, it really is. Um, it's a spiritual spa treatment anyway. Eucalyptus scented. Um, so anyway, I, I wrote this book. I did not intend to write a book because I have a day job. I was once a writer. I've written other books. And the one takeaway from that was it's really hard to write a book. And it's something that you do alone, typically in your basement, covered in sweat, eating Fig Newtons, feeling angry. <laughs> I think I may have revealed too much about my process, but whatever. And I thought, the first two times I did it, I thought, you know, that's one thing I'm never doing again, because why would I? That's really, really, really hard. It's like painting your house. It's like one of those things you're like, I'm not going to pay someone else. How hard is it to paint a house? <laughs> Try it. <laughs> right. Anyway, so... I got this job, and you know, I'm not getting super rich, but enough that I don't have to write a book, and I'm not gonna write a book. I got so mad that I decided to write a book just as catharsis to get it out. And I was mad about a really simple thing. Well, everything in my life is very simple because I'm a talk show host. I'm not an intellectual. I'm not a particularly deep thinker. I'm actually fairly shallow, which has served me well, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, so I was mad about a very simple thing. It had nothing to do with quantum physics, do you know what I mean, or decoding the human genome. It really was the most obvious of all questions, and what infuriated me, and does even now, thinking about it, was the fact that it was never publicly asked or debated. And the question, of course, was, why did Donald Trump just become the president? Yeah, because that was something nobody expected. And when I say nobody, I mean nobody. Not the Republicans, not the Democrats, not Trump's staff, nobody. Not one person called that. Well, you did. You did. You must be, here's what I've learned, actually, that's not true. I did meet one person, and he's a university professor at a college in upstate New York I've never heard of before or since, and he's a native German speaker who barely speaks English and knows nothing about American politics. 
And the point is, he was so off the grid mentally that it was obvious to him. <laughs> so, so if you take a piece of pork sausage and hold it in front of a dog, and then recite the Gettysburg Address, the dog does not hear a word you say because he doesn't speak English. He looks only at the pork sausage. And so the only people who could see what was going to happen are the people who were not distracted by all the noise. And this guy who didn't know anything about American policy just parachutes in and he's like, yeah, Trump's going to win. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, German guy, shh, you know, adults are talking. But anyway, the point is, the rest of us didn't think this was likely because it wasn't likely. Because even if you thought the Republican was going to win, there was a fairly deep bench of those to choose from. Like a very deep bench. Like there was over 100 Republican candidates or several hundred, whatever, there's a lot. <laughs> and it's like, why wouldn't you pick one of those? Why would you pick the guy who'd never been in politics at all? Yeah. That's the answer, exactly, that's the answer. So what I, I found so striking, having again spent a year of my life following Trump around, who I, I knew by the way, just because I'm in the media and like everyone in the media knows Trump, um, just of long, you know, for 20 years. Um, what I found so striking was not that people in Washington were mad that he got elected, and boy were they, on a bipartisan basis too. And this didn't really get reported, I don't think, to the extent it should have been, simply because it was reality. Reality is often the one thing that's never reported. But, but the people who were maddest were actually the permanent Republican establishment in Washington, really mad. Um, and they were mad because they felt really threatened by Trump. Um, and then, of course, the Democrats, I mean, this was like literally their nightmare. <laughs> actually, that's not true. Let me just note for a second. It, it, Trump is not what they feared. So growing up in this state, and I grew up around liberals, honestly, they would always tell you what they feared. They would always say, if Republicans ever got total control, what's, what's the thing they would do? I mean, for 50 years, Democrats said the same thing. Turn this into a theocracy. You know what I mean? And like, it would be the handmaiden's tale and it would be basically a medieval country where women would be in some kind of coverings and you know what I mean? We'd be speaking old English and <laughs> we'd sort of ban happiness and you know what I mean? And like, we're gonna elect Jerry Falwell to do that, and it's those religious nuts who were so scary. But when it actually happened, it being the election they feared most, it was not that at all. It was a very kind of secular New Yorker who'd been in the casino business, who was not an evangelical at all. I'm not mocking, just there are different kind of cultures in this country, and that wasn't his. My friend did the famous interview where he asked Trump what his favorite book of the Bible was. And Trump goes, the Bible? My friend goes, no, but what's your favorite book of the Bible? And Trump, like, it's a trick question, obviously. He's like, he's narrowing his eyes. He's like, look, the Bible, okay? <laughs> I think he's learned a lot since then. But the point is, <clears throat> this was not what they expected. It's not what they predicted. It wasn't the fever dream that had haunted them for decades. It was the opposite of that. And they found it more threatening. Now, why? is the question. So first, to, to the initial query, which is, why did this happen? And in Washington, this is what made me so angry. The explanations were so contemptuously dumb that I just couldn't even sit there and listen to them. And, and for the first week, I did, because these are the conventional stages of grief, something that happens you know, that you don't like <laughs> and that you don't want to happen. So of course, immediately, you know, your first reaction is denial. Like, well, that actually didn't happen. <laughs> didn't happen. You know, get elected president? Yeah, I don't think so. No, no. It can't happen, therefore it didn't. So your first sense is you just kind of project your will and erase reality. Well, that doesn't work ever. So your second reaction is to convince yourself that you have power over something that you have no power over. So we're going to undo, we're going to beat this. And we're going to, well, how are you going to beat it? You just won. We're going to take it from the Electoral College. You know, that's never been done. Really? You're really going to do that? Yeah, we, yes, we, yes, we are. You know, yes, we can. See, si puede. Yes, we can. And they actually kind of convinced themselves of that. Well, that was insane. And by the way, totally non-democratic. So when that didn't happen, they went to the third stage, which is, you know, some unseen actor did this. This is how, the, you know, Stalin used to explain the failure of the potato famine. You know, it's like the Soviet system is awesome. It works perfectly. And if it weren't for unseen saboteurs, we would have reached our goal. 
And so the unseen saboteurs, of course, were Putin. Putin did it. And I remember when they first hit me with that storyline, the first guest came on, it was like the first week of my show. Yes, Putin did it. I'm thinking, really, Putin did it? <laughs> this is a country that can't build a working escalator and they subverted our election? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, maybe. I mean, I don't know, my mind is open. Got an economy the size of Texas, life expectancy of 47, everyone's drunk. Maybe they did. <laughs> but you're gonna have to show me some evidence. And that was, shall we say, not forthcoming two years into it, uh, because it didn't happen. It's like demented. And then the third explanation, which you're actually seeing now quite a bit, is that Trump, Trump is a bad person, singularly bad person, the worst person who's ever lived, okay? He made Idi Amin look like Mother Teresa, okay? He's just, he's just that bad. And when he does something, he does it for the pure animal joy of inflicting cruelty on another living person. I'm serious. I watched MSNBC today getting dressed in my hotel. They were saying that. Why did he do this? Because well, he enjoys hurting people. He just, just loves it. So they've been saying that for a couple of years. But the new explanation is he got elected because a lot of America is exactly the same. And what they loved about Trump were his bad qualities. Those were the most appealing. And I thought, huh. I traveled a lot. I never met a single, I interviewed a million Trump voters trying to understand this. I never met one who said, you know what, I was on the fence until I saw the exit Hollywood tape. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, finally a candidate who speaks for me. <laughs> now you're talking my language, buddy. I love this man. I'm sorry. There wasn't such a person. Nobody felt that way. People voted for the candidate in spite of his shortcomings, and they did so not with the expectation that he had profound policy expertise. There were a lot of people who did. They didn't get chosen. They voted for him with the expectation that he would awaken the people in charge of America on the first Tuesday of November 2016 <laughs> and let them know that they had failed demonstrably failed, and worse than that. And by the way, let me just say, let's be blunt. As a Christian, I do believe in forgiveness and redemption, and I believe in being honest about the limits of human power and human wisdom and decision-making. We screw it up a lot. I certainly do. By the way, because of YouTube, you can see my screw-ups. <laughs> I always deny that I was in Dancing with the Stars, but I actually was. Okay? So I don't judge. I don't. But here's the difference. I never went on Dancing with the Stars again. <laughs> so that really is it. That's what we ask of people, and that's what we need to demand of our leaders, is not that they don't make mistakes, but that they acknowledge the mistakes that they make and critically learn from them. Learn from them. <laughs> I have a ton of children, like a ton, and I'm never surprised when they do something wrong, because I'm not, because I'm never surprised when people do, because I know what people are about, because I am one. What I demand of them is that they acknowledge that they did it and that they pledge to be better. That's it. That's all we can ask. It's all we should ask. But when people exert power over us, we have a right to expect it, okay? And if they don't perform that simple human task of learning from their errors, and if instead they deny those errors, and if instead they go even farther and blame us for those errors, then they are unfit to rule. It's that simple, okay? So I would say to compound this, the mistakes made by the people in charge, and by the way, I'm not limiting this to our political class in Washington, but I would say they're uniquely guilty. <laughs> but I would say also of the people who make the decisions that shape our economy, broadly speaking, and those who shape our culture, the people who determine what your kids watch on television or at the movie theater or online. They made a series of bad decisions over decades that had measurable effects on the population that were bad and well known to anyone who cared to learn them. So in 2015, when I learned this, I, I wrote the book. In 2015, the middle class in this country became a minority. And I read that in some relatively obscure place, by the way. I did not read that in the New York Times or the Washington Post. Not that I read either one anymore, but I did for many years. 
No, I read it in some, some website. And I thought, well, that can't be true. So I checked, and it was true. And I thought, well, I'm in the news business. My job is to follow developments, big and small, sometimes picky and really small. This is not only a major development, it's a pivot point in the history of the country. You can't have a functioning democracy, or by the way, a functioning market economy, without a robust middle class that comprises the majority of your country, period. And by robust, I mean really simple, self-supporting, not dependent upon government, living cheerfully, by and large, with the hope of doing better and with the near certainty that their kids could do better if they apply themselves. It's, it's, it's not a hard definition. It's a common sense one. And for my entire life, in fact, for the entire life of our country that we can measure, that has been the majority of our country. And in 2015, it became a minority. Now, if you, I, I left California, but if I lived here, I would have already known that because that's the story of this state and it's the saddest thing about this state. It's not that there aren't rich people. They're the richest people in the world live here. I just flew in from San Francisco this morning. You know, and it's not that there aren't poor people. There are more poor people in California than any other state. Like a third of all welfare recipients live in one state, this one. So you've got plenty of people at the polls. And by the way, you always have rich people. You always have poor people. Society will always be stratified because people are hierarchical. Just that's their nature. You know, the egalitarian ideal is not achievable. Dogs are hierarchical, by the way. So I, I think it's a mammal thing. But whatever. But in order to have a healthy, stable society, you have to have most people in the broad, happy center. And when that starts to change, you have not simply a moral problem. This isn't a college dorm room debate about what's, you know, what's just or not. Who cares? You have a very practical problem where your country is going to become super volatile, really volatile. And you might have, just throwing this out there, like a populist movement where voters get so mad they elect somebody out of nowhere. No, I'm, I'm serious. That's what happens. And wise leaders would anticipate this because it is so obvious I thought of it. <laughs> this is not complex in any way. This is Leadership 101. But they didn't come to that conclusion, or more precisely, they didn't care to come to that conclusion because they didn't care. Which leads you to the second obvious conclusion about our leadership class, and I mean across sectors here. I mean, this, this applies every bit as much to the tech sector, Travis, what's his name at the car company? What is it? No, Travis Kalnick, the teenage billionaire who runs Uber, whatever, our tech chieftains, as, as it does to our U.S. senators. They didn't actually care. And I guess I've already noticed at the outset, I'm a lifelong conservative. I'm not a liberal. I'm not in therapy. I'm not the kind of person who talks <laughs> the, the touchy-feely language of the town I grew up in at all, okay? So this is not a touchy-feely observation. It's a true one, and it's really simple. Empathy is a prerequisite for leadership. You have to deeply care about the people you're in charge of, or you will not do a good job of leading them. And this is true across the board. It's true in your family. If you don't love your children, if you wouldn't give your life for your children, you will be a bad parent and hurt them. So the question is not, are you going to be a perfect parent and make a, a flawless series of decisions? No, you're not. You're going to screw it up. But in the end, if you care more deeply about your children than anything else, you'll be a good enough parent. You will be every one of you. Empathy is the key to parenthood, but it's also the key to every other kind of leadership. If you didn't care about the safety of your men, would you be a good officer? No, they would die. If you didn't really care about your employees, would your company thrive? Of course not. If you didn't care in a democracy about your voters, would you be an effective politician? No, you'd be the ones we just kicked out. So that's it right there. And I would say part of the key, and I see this all the time, I saw it tonight, Trump gives these speeches, usually during the primetime hours, you know, multiple a week. He loves it. And, and I have to say, um, it's pretty impressive in a way, as someone who talks for a living, that he'd stand up there on national television with no notes at all at like 71. I'm 49. I can barely do it. <laughs> and he gets up there and he just goes. He, just, he doesn't know what the terminus is. He doesn't know what the destination is. He just gets on the bus. 
I don't care. I'm serious. Just give me a Diet Coke and let me start talking. We, always, we, we actually always say, because they often happen during our hours, so we're watching carefully. And my producers always say, when he gets to Space Force, we're almost done. Uh, I should also note, I have no idea what Space Force is, but I love it. I literally have no idea. I'm not sure they do actually know what it is either, but I can say that if my son, who's 21, called me as a senior in college and said, you know what, I thought I was going into, you know, whatever, private equity, but I think I'm joining Space Force. <laughs> I would be so, my first question would be, what's the uniform like? The second question would be, <laughs> the second thing I would say is, I'm so proud of you, boy. <laughs> anyway, but the point is, other than Space Force, the one recurring moment in every Trump speech and the reason that people like these speeches so much is he actually does because he's not working strictly from a script. He does get like caught right up in it. I mean, it's just like you see who he is in the speech because that really is who he is. And trust me, I know him. That's who he is. It's exactly, I mean, less profanity probably, slightly less, but, but like that's actually him. And he gets so caught up in it, there's always one moment where he looks out and they start cheering him. And of course he loves that. And he goes, you know what? I love you. I love you. First of all, who talks like that? <laughs> the answer, of course, is only people who mean it. And by the way, you know, there are many kinds of love. I don't know if this is a love that's going to, like, call you the next day. <laughs> I don't judge. But in that moment, it's totally real. It's 100% real. He just stops in the middle of this. He looks out and he's like, you know what? I love these people. And because he's emotionally incontinent, he can't keep that in. And, no, I'm not joking. And the first time it happened, having spent a whole lifetime watching political speeches, I'm like, what was that? <laughs> and then I realized that was an authentic moment. And the crowd understands that, not because they think about it, but because they can feel it. Because the truth, the deep truth, underneath all of it is we know who you are. This is true of everyone. A lot of our conversations are pure 100% pretense, where we're all overthinking things and rationalizing them and going along with someone else's rationalization when the truth is right in front of our faces. You meet someone for two minutes and you know who that person is. You can smell it. It's an animal sense that we're born with. And other species don't override it with their higher brain, but we do. And I always tell my children, don't do that. If you think someone's dishonest, if you can smell it, he's dishonest, that person's dishonest. I'm, I'm sorry to sound like a Democratic senator now. I do believe in due process, by the way. I don't think we ought to imprison anyone on the basis of odor. But I do think in our, per because I believe in fairness, but I do believe in our personal lives, we always know who other people are. Always. Who is really shocked by anything we've learned about any president, ever? Yeah, Bill Clinton with an intro. Oh, I can't believe it doesn't sound like a Bill Clinton I know. What? Yeah, it does. Everything I have learned about Trump, good and bad, I'm like, yeah, I know the guy. Not because I went to high school with him, but because I've talked to him and I've watched him. It's true of everybody. I mean, I always say to my children, the upside is, you know, it's not all, it's not all bad. Like, you think you're hiding things about yourself? Like, you're really envious, or you're an alcoholic, or you're sort of secretly mean, or whatever your kind of hidden sin is. Everybody already knows that, actually. It was like a bad toupee. You're like, I'm fooling him now. <laughs> no, you're not. Not for one second. People are like, there's something weird about your hair. They don't say it, but they know it. <laughs> and as I always say to my children, it's kind of horrifying to realize that every time you interact with another person, you are stripped bare. You really are stripped bare. But the good news is a lot of them love you anyway. Like, it's actually not worth pretending when you start to think about it. They already know. And the one thing they know about Trump is that in his way, he does love them, actually. He does. And maybe it's a fleeting love. I don't know what kind of love it is. But it's a lot more love than they're getting from anybody else in power. It's true. And that's why they love him back. 
It's so not complicated. It's actually so helpful. I said at the outset, being shallow is just like the greatest <laughs> gift. I have ever, I'm not kidding, I would recommend it. As I was writing this book, I have two dogs. My wife and I have two dogs. All, our four children are gone. So we become like, you know, your parents basically, like embarrassingly attached to the dog. We text each other pictures. There's a lot of talking about it. It's like horrifying. <laughs> but it's actually kind of in story. We have two spaniels, Meg and Dave. And as I was, and they sleep on the bed, and we really love them. And the head dog, the Springer, Meg, um, sort of leads the sub dog, um, the subordinate dog on you know, these adventures in the backyard. And so as I was writing the book, I was watching them for like the 11th morning in a row, open the door, they run out, and they're, they've never been as psyched as they are now, except for yesterday and the day before and like the preceding <laughs> 10 years, because their mission is really clear, get the squirrel, that's it. There's no ambient noise to Megan Dave. It's like, they know what the job is, they love the job, they're not worried about whether they're going to achieve it, which obviously they never will, because it's a squirrel, you can't catch them, but it doesn't matter. Their pure dog joy, even through the glass of my windows, radiates like that weird film that comes off a jet engine on a hot day. That's joy. And I'm watching this and I'm like, that's the key. Keep it as simple as you can. So, I mean, I'll say one thing to end, Wh and I will take your hostile questions. And by the way, you've been so nice, and I'm, you, I live in a world where it's all hostile questions, so it's a little bit disconcerting to be in a room full of people I agree with and who are nice to me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. You, you see this in people who've been through trauma, like it makes them nervous if you're too nice, so I hope you'll say something nasty. <laughs> but I think everybody who voted for Trump feels on some level protective of Trump because he has been under such relentless attack. And those attacks are not simply aimed at him, but of course they're aimed at anyone who dared vote for him or support him or might show some kind of affinity for the things that he is saying. In Washington, I will say, a lot of the people who are sort of open-minded with Trump are gravely disappointed that Trump has not been a better master of the legislative system and of the executive branch. Because in Washington, it's a political city. There's not a, uh, not a slight on Washington. I mean, if you go to Detroit and you like, don't know what a transmission is, like you're not in the game. In DC, we're about government, okay? So the expectation is the president will come and he will put into effect his program. And he'll do that through the Congress or through the agencies and the executive branch that he controls. And Trump has done that to some extent, but not entirely. And so you hear people say, well, you know, but he doesn't know how government works. I think that's true, actually. And he hasn't learned that much. He doesn't have control over his own branch. You know, three million people in the executive branch, and every single one of them opposes Trump. So it's like three million to one. <laughs> that's only a slight exaggeration, no, for real. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I was thinking, maybe that's not really the purpose. And that's not really the purpose. A conventional president comes in and is judged purely on the basis of, not purely, but largely on the basis of the policies that he affects. You know, he signs this bill and everyone's like, ah, he's an amazing president. He got that done. By the way, most of the bills that he signs recede into the memory hole and are never thought of again, okay? I don't think Trump is that president. I think Trump's purpose in our country is to describe things. That is his talent. Trump is literally the reigning champion. He is a, an international level genius at saying the thing that nobody else will say but that everyone should have been saying for quite some time. <laughs> this, this, this summer we went to, to we, we took the show to Helsinki, Finland, partly because they have great salmon fishing there, so you know. Uh, really good, by the way, you should go. Um, but partly because there was a, the, the Trump-Putin summit there, so we interviewed Trump. And I'm not an expert on, I've traveled a lot, but I'm not hardly a foreign policy expert. Um, but I am sort of interested in like, what do you do with these post-war, post-World War II institutions that have kind of governed the Western world for 70 years? One of them is NATO. 
So I asked, off camera, I asked Trump a question about NATO. And he said something that I'd never heard anybody say and that thrilled me and thrills me now even as I think of it. And by the way, no one has ever been thrilled by NATO before. That happened to me. <laughs> but I said, so we need it. He goes, you know, why don't we have NATO? <laughs> and, I, and I was like, thinking to myself, I don't know, because NATO's good? <laughs> and he goes, I thought the point of NATO was to keep the Soviets from invading Western Europe. There are no more Soviets. So why do we still have it? <laughs> and I sort of searched as someone who supported NATO as a Cold War, you know, conservative kid or whatever. I searched in my memory bank for like a good answer and I couldn't find one. And by the way, I'm not calling for eliminating NATO. It's a structure and let's use it for something. But what is its use? It seems like that's the, that's the or a question. Like that's the first thing you would have to answer before proceeding, you know, and running NATO or sending it money. Why do we have it? And by the way, I remember the Soviet Union fellow. I was on my honeymoon. It was August of 1991. I'll never forget. I was in Bermuda on the beach. And the guy who brought the drinks, like the Soviet Union fellow, oh, really? Hmm. So, uh, no, true story. Mid Ocean Club, Bermuda, 1991. That was August of 91. So that's 27 years later. Trump is like, why do we still have it? So I don't know if he was testing this on me or what, but he goes out and he asks that question. That literally, he wasn't attacking, he was like, why do we still have it? It's a fair question. Hey, NATO experts, what's the answer? You know what answer he got? What? Shut up! <laughs> what, what, are you working for Putin? That's treason! <laughs> and it sort of reminded me of that moment when you're, if you have children, you know, they go through this, this why stage when they're little, and it's like infuriating. And they'll be like, well, why? You know, why are we doing that, mommy? Oh, well, Danny, uh, we're doing that because, well, because we're doing that, and, and that's what adults do. Well, why? Well, because it's the right thing to do, Danny. Well, why, but why are we doing it? Why is it the right thing to do? Mommy's getting a glass of wine, Danny. Why don't you be quiet? <laughs> and that's exactly the response Trump got. Shut up, they explained. And that is the tell. That's it right there. If we were playing poker, we'd win. Because what they're saying is, we, our hand, there's nothing in it. We don't have an answer to the question we're supposed to be in charge of. We're the NATO experts. Take that moment and multiply it by, I don't know, every policy. Why don't we have a wall? Where I live, it's like, well, because a wall is stupid. Why is it stupid? Because walls are bad. Really, you have them around your house. Why are they bad? Well, because countries don't have walls. Well, some do. Well, walls are bad. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay, I'm willing to believe walls are bad. I'm willing to believe NATO should still exist, but why? Shut up, Danny. Mommy's getting a glass of wine. <laughs> that's it. And by the way, that's enough. Because Trump will be gone. We will all be gone, by the way. We're just passing through. This is just a spot on a continuum that goes on, we hope, a long time. But if you want to fix the country, you have to describe with some precision what's wrong with it. You need to bring the conversation back to what matters. And that is a profound contribution. Whether those questions are answered and the issues solved or not, we are finally talking about things that actually matter. And thank God for that. Ha! <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I totally lost control. Okay. I'm sure I way overspoke. So um, I, I did, didn't I? Yes, I did. You're nodding. Okay. Tucker, th thank you, Tucker. He, he's agreed to take a couple of questions, and we do have some time. Our first one is going to be from this gentleman who I drug out from the back, so you guys all up front don't get the first round here. Our first question. Yes, sir. So on be, on, first of all, on behalf of the state of California and the land of gracious living, thank you for your talents. <laughs> thank you. Good. Secondly, my question is, my wife, Ellen, is right there. In April of 2016, her and I knew Donald Trump was going to win. In fact, I stood in front of a university crowd with a reporter in the crowd and stated that exact statement. I'm impressed. I was destroyed in that article. I, I bet you were. On November 6th of 2016, I know where I was. I would like for you to recant that evening and where you were on the night of November 6, 2016. <laughs> uh, well, I was uh, where I spent much of my life on a TV set 
and uh, in New York City with you know a bunch of people I know. Um, and as this began to happen, and it became clear, well, so without getting too boring, but we get these things called exit polls, which are just surveys of voters as they leave the polling place. And they're done by a group of news organizations, or they're done by various organizations, but I mean, we get them because we're a news organization. And they supposedly give us insight into what the result's gonna be so we can prepare ourselves for our sparkling commentary. <laughs> and the exit polls all showed what we expected, which was that Trump was gonna lose. I have to say now, it sounds like I'm bragging, I didn't necessarily think Trump was gonna lose because that I live in Washington, not New York, and the day before I had taken the Acela, which is our train, I think you're about to get one, goes from like, <laughs> I think it, it goes from like Chino to San Juan Capistrano or something. Yeah, trust me, that was heavy irony, just so you know. <laughs> Mass transit in California, yeah, it's a perfect, yeah, Rhode Island maybe, okay, but anyway, um, but I had been on the train to New York and I ran into actually a guy I knew from San Francisco. And he was a lawyer in San Francisco, super nice guy and a big Democrat. And he had worked for Clinton, whatever, sort of moderate Democrat. And he gets, he sits next to me and I said, hey man, what do you think of San Francisco? I thought you were in a law firm there. Yeah, I am, but I got called in and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to Philadelphia. I said, what are you doing in Philadelphia? He said, there's an all hands on deck call that, you know, politically active Democrats who have time to volunteer and can pay their own plane fare need to get to Pennsylvania right away. And I was like, why would they get to Pennsylvania? You're like up a million points. Everyone knows Pennsylvania can't you know, go Republican. Like what, to Donald Trump? We, this we know. And he's like, no, they think they're gonna lose Pennsylvania. I go, really? So I made a couple calls on the train. Oh yeah, they're panicked. Well, if they lose Pennsylvania, then like there are a bunch of other states like Pennsylvania demographically that they could easily, that's when I thought, wow, this could actually happen. So I wasn't maybe quite as confused just on the base of that as some of the people, but there were people who do not work at Fox, but who had come in as, um, as you know, analysts for the night. I think you know who they are. And I uh, happened to be sitting next to one of them, and they were very upset, like very upset. And not because they're liberal, they're not, but because Trump was an enormous orange middle finger wagging in their face. <laughs> I'm serious, it was. That's exactly what it was. If Trump gets elected, and I have spent the last year assuring people that, like, there's no way, no way. On, look, I cover this. Look, okay. If I have a question about plumbing, I'll ask you. But if you've got a question about politics, I mean, this stuff's complicated, okay? <laughs> I've run a few campaigns in my time. Maybe you recognize me. <laughs> if you've been saying that stuff for a year, and all of a sudden on national TV live, it turns out that you're dumb. That's like, um, that's a, I mean, even your wife is like, really? You've got one job to call a stupid election that happens once every four years and you get it backward? Like, how did that happen? So it really was personally threatening to them, like to such an extent that actually, I, I finally left. I finally left. I was like, you know, I, this is too tense. I don't even, you know. I don't even want to be here. And actually, I have to, it's funny you ask that, or you ask that. Um, I don't smoke anymore, I haven't smoked in years, but I go outside and there was a cameraman smoking. And I was like, give me one of those. <laughs> I did, I did. It was an American spirit blue, I ripped the filter off. It was delicious, last cigarette I'll ever have. But I thought, you know what, Trump gets elected, I'm not supposed to smoke, obviously it's bad. But I'm gonna do it this one time, because like in my own sort of private way, it was my little act of defiance. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's about as defiant as you can get in a liberal town. Anyway, excuse me. Next question to your right, sir. Yes. Uh, Tucker, a lot of people always ask, how do we come back together? My question is, um, isn't where we are and isn't a certain amount of friction a good thing for democracy? I think it is if, if, if we all buy into the precepts of democracy which are that people get to express, I mean, the basic p point about democracy is that people have a voice. All, you know, all people do, even if they belong to a particularly unfashionable group. Um, and that's the point of Trump's election. And it was the most distressing part about the election, actually, was that it confirmed, look, for democracy to work, everyone has to believe that it's real. They really do. And if after, you know, 
I mean, the Immigration Act that changed the country passed in 1965, okay? So that was 51 years before the last election. So during that time, every public opinion poll taken on the question of immigration showed the same thing, which is Americans like immigrants, obviously. No country has ever admitted in peacetime as many immigrants as we have. It's not even close. This has never happened in world history, and we don't have riots because Americans like are nice people, despite what you hear on CNN. Like, they're nice people, actually. They're not bigots. They're very open-minded, and they're very nice, and they like immigrants, and they should because immigrants are awesome. But they also believe that it's their country, and they have a right to determine who comes here. They're sort of like, I'm not against dinner parties. I love dinner parties. We have them all the time. I choose 12 people, and they come and have dinner at my house. If I didn't get to choose them, if 12 randoms showed up and started eating my food, <laughs> that would not be a dinner party. It would be a home invasion, okay? <laughs> so, no, it's true. The difference is that you have control over one and the other is being imposed upon you by force. And so for all these decades, Americans have said exactly that. The overwhelming majority, we wanna have control and we don't. And so what do you conclude after a while? You conclude that I keep voting, I keep putting quarters in the slot machines and the bars never come up. It's rigged, it's not real. And I don't think that's healthy. If people, look, if people believe that they have a voice, maybe not a huge voice, not as big a voice as George Soros, but you know, he's a billionaire, I get it, okay? <laughs> and a very good person. Um, or Tom Steyer or whatever, no, I, obviously joking. But I mean, look, there are, you know, people who have enough money to buy their own media outlets have more political power than those of us who don't. I mean, I get it. But all of us have some power because we can vote. And if we vote in large groups, they have to listen to us. That is the basic understanding of democracy. And that's what keeps the country calm. And that's what all of us growing up in this country were taught as small children. That's why it's a good country, by the way. Because if you don't like something, you don't have to storm the Bastille or burn the police station. You can vote and you can do it like every two years or four years or six years. You have lots of opportunities. And over time, maybe not immediately, but over time, they will listen to you because the system will require them to. Schoolhouse Rock, anyone? Okay. <laughs> so if that proves not to be true, and if the public, the large majority, keeps saying, I would like this, and they don't respond, you start to think, well, maybe this is all fake. And that's when you get mad and start doing stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily do. So it's really important to make sure the democracy is real. And the tragic thing for me in watching this whole Trump thing is, it was like the ruling class in DC, which should be wise enough to know that, they only exist because of democracy. They decided to prove to everybody watching that in fact it's not real. So Trump gets the nomination. The Republican Party, what was their answer to that? We'll take it from the convention. It's like, what? No, the voters voted for him. It's not your choice. I get it. Sorry, Jeb. But I'm not being mean. I'm just like, I get it. That's, that's, you know, they're winners and losers. It's a contest. But what you're not allowed to do is steal it. Because first of all, it's wrong. And second of all, it infuriates people. You steal it, maybe the fans sweep down from the stands onto the field. Maybe they get that mad. Who knows what they do if you treat them like that? Don't do that. But they did. So what they basically did was said, oh, are, do you secretly suspect that this democracy is really an oligarchy run by a small number of people for their own benefit? Guess what? You're right! <laughs> they pull the mask off. What are you doing, you nutcase, to do something like that? What you're doing is ensuring that the country is gonna be way less happy, way less secure, way more suspicious of you, and much more likely to do something crazy, Dumbo. Like that's, that's literally the last thing you do in a democracy. But they did it because they're not impressive. That's why, because they're self-centered and lacking wisdom. Not because, and I, and I should just make one thing really clear. It's not because they're dumb. I use it as sort of a catch-all term for poor behavior and what motivates it, but that's not true. Like, they're actually smart. That's what makes it more infuriating. Intelligence is not the same as wisdom. Wisdom can't exist without self-awareness. As my father always used to say when I was little, the root of all wisdom is knowing how, he actually used a bad word, which I won't repeat, but is knowing how flawed you are. It's true. 
That's the point where you become wise, when you realize how screwed up you are, when you realize the limits of your own power. Then everything falls into perspective. What's the opposite of that? Hubris. Who's especially prone to that? Powerful men. Not just men, but especially men, I would say. Having known them. Having been one at times. You get the feeling that, like, yeah, you know, I don't think you know who you're dealing with here, hmm? <laughs> and you become a buffoon, actually. And sooner or later, you're exposed as a buffoon. It's, it, I mean, this is like the most basic human principle detailed at quite some length in the Old Testament, if you're interested. So anyway, that is a terrible and destabilizing thing. The answer is its mirror image. If you want things to calm down, apply democracy. It's really simple. And by the way, I don't, I'm not calling for direct democracy. Like, I get it. I took American history. We have a representative democracy that is designed to filter the passions of the majority through the kind of cool filter of wise people we elect to do that. <laughs> and it, it's worked, actually, pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. Better than any other country. And we need to do that again. So in other words, just because the majority all of a sudden wants free ice cream, eh, you know, it doesn't need to be free. But if they keep calling for free ice cream, you gotta give them an ice cream discount at some point. Because it's their country, actually. So if the majority of people say, you know, if they elect a president who wants to build a wall, and you're like, I don't think a wall is gonna work, or I think it's kind of embarrassing to have a wall. I don't care what you think. Build a wall, pal. Because the cost of not building the wall <laughs> is to tell people that they don't have a voice. <clears throat> this is the last thing I'll say. What do you think happens in the long run? By the way, you can't do that to anybody. It's not just about democracy and it's not just about our government or whatever. It's about other people. If you have power and you misuse that power, they'll get you every single time. If you are rude and dismissive to someone, to enough people in public, just at like dinner parties or whatever, meeting them and you're like, yeah, okay. oh, you're not important? Yeah, sorry, excuse me. Like, there will come a time when one of those people will get you. People never forget being patronized or dismissed. They never forget it. Your own kids don't forget it. By the way, you can do whatever you want to your kids. Because they're literally powerless. So if you're like, you know what? I want you to wear a Viking hat to school today and every day. <laughs> That's embarrassing, mommy. I don't care. You're wearing a Viking hat to school. People make fun of me and beat on me. No, no, tough Viking hat for you. You could literally do that. Like maybe you find that amusing. You just do that. At some point, that kid's going to turn 18. Because by the way, they all do, despite what you want. Like it just kind of happens. And at that point, what do you think the consequences are going to be of that kind of, you see what I'm saying? So the key mistake of people who hold power is believing that they will hold it forever. And that they can do whatever they want when they have it. And that is a lie that they tell themselves. And in the end, those people are going to get spanked really hard. And they're going to regret being so unwise and short-sighted and selfish during that fleeting moment when they did hold power. Our, to your right, sir. Our next question to your right. Wait, okay. did you say this is the last question? No, I said our, my, our next question to oh, your right. okay. Tucker, thank you for bringing common sense to a world of nonsense every day. We well, appreciate thank you. that. Thank you. My, que my name's Terrence Bates, and here's my question. I'm 49 years old as well, and I have never seen our country in such chaos. My question is this. Do you think the left is so unhinged and so chaotic because they are desperate for attention, because all the attention right now is on President Trump and how well he's doing? You know, I think that's part of it. Um, I think that's part of it. I also think, and I've thought a lot about this just because my show, you know, whatever you like it or not, it's like the only show where there is a debate every night and I try to make it a more symmetrical debate. It's very hard to get good, you know, I, I don't want to beat up on like some college kid every, and it's like, you know what I mean? I don't need to do that. I don't, I don't enjoy doing that. So I really try to get the other side to the extent as possible. So I see a lot of what people I disagree with say. And I've really concluded that the differences are far deeper than I thought they were. And Trump has brought this into stark relief because we're not having, so for my whole, I've been in TV 22 years, 
and mostly on debate shows. And for most of that time, we were having policy debates. What, what I thought were, you know, I'm pretty literal, as you <laughs> I may have revealed. And so I assumed they were policy debates. Like, there's this thing, you know, we're debating, you know, what, name something, I don't know. This policy, gun control. I would have these gun control debates, and I mean, I'll admit, I'm a, a lifelong hunter, and I, you know, own a lot of guns, so I, maybe I'm emotional, too emotional about it or something, but I don't think I'm that emotional, and I would have these debates, and I'm like, okay, here's the data, you know, here's the social science, I'm showing you mine, you show me yours, and we'll decide who's got a better case. And for like 20 years, they'd be like, no, I don't care what you say. Like, they were never convinced at all, like at all, by anything I ever said. And not just the polemical stuff, but like the facts. And I began to think, maybe we're having two separate conversations. Maybe I'm trying to win this person over with reason, but this person is doing something very different. Maybe this person is just trying to exert control over me. And I thought, that can't be right, because who would want to control another person? That's like literally the last thing I would want to do. I'm going to have zero interest in that. Because I don't need to, because I have like a happy life and happy marriage and happy kids, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to control other people. Why would you want that? I just think it's bizarre. It's so far from the way I see the world that I just couldn't imagine that anybody else felt that way, which is a huge mistake, actually. You know, just because you don't like pistachio doesn't mean someone else doesn't. You know, people have different motives, actually. And what I've concluded is that this is not at all a policy debate, and I'm an idiot for pretending it was for all these decades. What it's really about is power. So conservatives, or I don't even know conservative, what is the word anymore? I don't even know. People who aren't like on that side. <laughs> who aren't screaming at people they disagree with in restaurants. If you can't imagine a scenario where you would scream at a politician you didn't vote for in a public place, then we're on the same side, okay? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so for, for people like us, the point of politics is utilitarian. Like you vote for someone in order that like whoever's in power back off enough that you can have a happy family or a successful business or go to church, whatever church you want. You know, just like to make room for the things that actually matter, which are not politics. Okay, that's the whole point from our perspective of the system is to give us enough freedom to do our thing. That's not how they see it at all. So it really does break down according to temperament. It's not like people are convinced most of the time to join a side. It's like they feel it. I see it in my own children. I really do. I had one child I thought was liberal. <laughs> I'm serious. Because we'd walk through Georgetown and there were these homeless people and most of my kids were like, hey, back off, homeless guy. <laughs> and then there, we had, I had this one daughter who's like, can we take him home? And I'm like, oh, liberal. And, and I always used to say to my wife, you know, she's going to grow up, she's going to be chaining herself to the White House gates for animal rights or something. You know what I mean? I really like this child so much, though. So it was like, okay, you got one liberal out of four, it's fine. <laughs> that child has not turned out to be liberal at all, like at all, because she went to all these liberal schools and she looks around and she goes, I'm not quite sure what you're into, but I'm definitely not into that at all. Like, I don't want any part of that. Why do you want any part of that? It's not about the policies, it's like because she's kind of a happy person. And she doesn't need to join a group of unhappy people in order to feel powerful. So what it really comes down to <laughs> is that the left is a party-based movement. I didn't get this for years, even though it's my job to understand it. I never understood it. It's a party-based movement. The average Republican is a Republican because it's the party that's closest to his views, right? But like if the Republican Party supported something you didn't agree, that you really hated, you'd be like, yeah, no, I'm not voting for you anymore. W right? <laughs> of course. Your loyalty isn't to the Republican Party. They just may be the party that represents you. She wants to see them win. So you'll be left alone. The Democratic Party doesn't matter what they do. They invaded Canada tomorrow. You'd watch every MSNBC anchor be like, you know, Canada's been a threat for a long time. We haven't, you know, we haven't really talked about it. You know, there are Canadians living in our midst. Let's intern them. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They obey. They obey. They're obedient little people. <laughs> and they're obedient. They're obedient because the group 
is where their power comes from. This explains a lot, actually. It explains their hysteria at Trump and Brett Kavanaugh and the Congress. So I, I spent eight years living in the District of Columbia with Barack Obama as president, who I thought was actually kind of wrecking the country. I'd see Valerie Jarrett at Safeway. I never said word one to her. I shared a backyard with Susan Rice for six years. Yeah, I did. I mean, we didn't share a backyard. Our backyards, we had a fence between our backyards. There's her house right there. Shaving and there's Susan Rice. Yeah, okay. I'd see her every Halloween. No, I w no, we had a Halloween parade in our street and I would always have a beer with Susan Rice. No, I'm serious. Actually, I always got along with Susan Rice. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be mad at people. I, don't, I didn't see it that way. By the way, one of her kids became this like, right winger at Stanford. Good for him. Anyway, the point is, the point is, it never occurred to me as much as I profoundly disapproved of what she was doing to be mean to her because why would you ever do something like that? It's just like not even, it never even occurred to me. Our kids played on the same soccer team, actually. But anyway, whatever. The point is, because it's D.C. Now, the other side feels like you literally are not allowed to go to Starbucks. Like, you're just not allowed. Why? Because they are so threatened by the loss of political power that they can't think straight. What you're seeing is people who are threatened. Like, I feel like I'm pretty reasonable until I feel threatened. No, I'm serious. Like, if I felt like you were threatening me, threatening my family, my job, something I really cared about, I'd be very unreasonable with you. And I think you would be with me if you felt I was threatening you. Like, really, as a person, threatened. An election does not threaten me. It threatens them. Because a lack of political power means to them a lack of personal power. They are personally invested. Politics is how they feel powerful. They are terrified people. And politics makes them feel strong. I know I'm getting kind of shrinky on you here. <laughs> but it's true. It's totally true. This has just come to me in like the past month after all these years of having arguments over policy. And I'm like, well, but maybe we could find the best way. Like, no, I don't care what the best way is. I want to make sure you obey me. And you really think of it this, this is the last thing I'll say, but think of it this way. So this is a group full of, I mean, I don't know what your politics are, but I probably not that many. Yeah, I know what your politics are. Okay, just, just kidding. <laughs> but when you go back tonight to wherever you live, I bet you a 20 bucks a person that you're not going to lie awake thinking, you know, somewhere in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, 3,000 miles from here, there is someone who doesn't agree with me. And I want to make sure that person is forced to agree with me. Or I'm not going to sleep well, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> In fact, I'll bet you another 20 bucks you won't think of Williamsburg, Brooklyn at all tonight. <laughs> but I can promise you that somewhere in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, there are a whole lot of people worrying that in the Mississippi Delta somewhere, in a town you've never heard of, there is one guy who's not fully with the program. And he must be brought to heel. He has real questions about this new bathroom policy. And we need, to, we need to get him in line. Because that's not politics. What you are practicing is politics. What they are practicing is theology. That's, that's an evangelical faith, a faith without a god. It's a secular religion, but it's a religion nonetheless. It's a religion that forces others to convert or suffer. That's exactly what it is. And that's why the emotional temperature is so high, unsustainably high. Anyway, that's what I've learned. <laughs> we, Tucker, all the way in the back, center section, all the way, way back here, way back here. Oh, hey. We, ha we have time for one last question. All right, hit me with it. This one is coming from a recent graduate of Chapman University just down the street here. All right. School of Communications, he's 24 years old, Carson Combs. Carson, what is your question? Uh, first of all, Tucker, huge fan. Thank you so much thank for you. taking my question. Uh, first of all, as a log cabin Republican, I want to thank you so much for giving us a voice on your show. Of course, always. the left always. completely disregards us and dismisses us and likes to act like we don't exist. Um, my question to you, as a recent college graduate, I see this, these countless 
walkouts and aggressive, hostile r riots that are masked as peaceful protests on campus um, where these essentially very whiny leftists just refuse to listen to any sort of dissenting opinion uh, to the point where there's conservative speakers who are not allowed to come on campus for safety reasons. Uh, David Rubin and Coulter Ben Shapiro, um, which is just I'm so I'm seeing all three of those people tomorrow. How weird is that? That's awesome. Isn't that weird? Uh, literally I'm all jealous. three tomorrow. <laughs> um, but, but so my question is, what do, you, what do you make of the future of college campuses if this is what we're seeing so frequently on them right now, whether it be a small school like Chapman uh, or, um, you know, Berkeley uh, or what, what, do you, what do you make of that and, and uh, do you see a solution to moving past these these Well, I protests. mean, it, it's such a, I mean, I have, you know, children in college, two children in college right now, and another on the way. And so it's a question that I think about a lot. And there are a couple, it depends upon how you think of it. I mean, I, I guess the obvious point is that a lot of our humanities programs are, are not only a joke, um, and I'm not, by the way, there's a lot about American higher education that, that leads the world still. I mean, I think if you you're taking engineering classes or the sciences or studying to be a veterinarian or there are a lot of really serious disciplines that are still taught and taught better than they are anywhere else. No one in my family's ever taken a class like that. <laughs> I come from a long line of people with fake jobs. <laughs> my father was anchor of ABC in LA and you know what I mean? My mother was an artist and you know what I mean? So like in my world, it's English and history. That's what we study. And that's what my children have studied. And I have watched it really carefully and concluded that like they're not really teaching anything. So it's sort of a joke. But worse than that, there's a huge cost to this actually. And not just a financial cost. I mean, it's the single greatest expense for most families. The student loan debt load is at rec literally record highs, another story that no one reports, um, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a huge personal cost to it. I mean, there's never been a time in history where a society has taken the overwhelming majority of young people between 18 and 22 and forced them to be idle, actually. You know, there is some percentage of college students who, who get a lot out of it and are focused and driven. I was not that guy. <laughs> um, that's for sure. I never should have gone to college, like ever. And my father, in his wisdom, didn't want me to go and really disapproved of me going. He said, you're going to be a journalist. Don't go to college. This is, what, you're idiotic. He never visited. I don't think he knows where I went. He was so unimpressed, and he was right. Um, but there's never been a society that's done that wholesale. And you know why it happened. It happened because of the GI Bill and the promise that that was the, that, that was the key to taking you know, the step into the, to the class above you. That was key to the American dream. But the truth of it is, it's not actually for most people. And so what you get, especially for young men, you know, you lock up boys from, you know, during the four most vigorous years of their life in this kind of nerf padded room and feed them beer. <laughs> and a lot of them go crazy or get, I'm not joking, or get addicted a lot. I mean, what's the addiction or alcoholism rate of, you know, kids who spent four years in college? It's unbelievably high. It's like Russia high. It's bad. <laughs> Russia! So there's a huge cost to this. But how to interpret, how to understand what the, the actual hysteria, I'm not using that word lightly, like the clinical hysteria, the Freudian hysteria that we're watching on college campuses now, the total clampdown on speech and thought, where anybody who has, even the most moderate person who's like, are you really sure? Shut up! You know, you're getting thrown out. What is that about? And if you think about it sort of longitudinally, or you pull back a little bit with some perspective, what you're really seeing are the last moments of a dying order, actually. So people who feel secure, who feel like they have power and will have it for a long time, have a pretty light hand, actually, on others. They don't need to act like that. Because in the end, they know they're in charge. When you start to feel like you're losing control, that and this is true across regimes, by the way, including academic regimes, you start to really clamp down in a way that beclowns you, that makes you like an idiot. And when you decide that Ben Shapiro is a right-wing extremist and must be destroyed, it's like, what? <laughs> Seriously, there's an amazing videotape that says it all to me. It's from 1989, and it's of Nikolai Ceausescu, who was, of course, along with his lovely wife, Elena, uh, the dictator of Romania under when it was a Soviet satellite state. 
1989, there was, in effect, a coup, an uprising, and he was swiftly tried uh, by a group of officers in a makeshift courtroom and led out to behind the building and executed with his wife in the snow, wearing overcoats. And the whole thing was videotaped. And you can watch it, not the shooting part, but everything up to that was videotaped. And so there's Ceausescu standing there, and he's run this country for 40 years as a god, okay? Really, as like on the North Korean model almost, like they worshipped him. And in a flash, he realizes he's about to be executed. So as he's being led out in chains by the guard who's literally about to shoot him, he turns and starts barking orders at the guard. And I'm thinking to myself, really? Lacking some perspective, I would say. <laughs> you have about 45 seconds left to breathe, and you're yelling orders at the guy who's about to execute you? Why are you doing that? Because that's what they always do when they feel they're losing control. Always. So what we're really seeing is the effect of the internet. Talk to a young person, you may be one of them, probably are, who is not with the program, doesn't need to be a right winger or whatever, doesn't, but not with the program, you know what the program is, what we're all required to believe, all the lies that we're required by law to tell all day long. So let's say you don't believe that and you're 22 and you're in a college. You have decided that you're thinking for yourself. That is a radical act in the current moment, okay? And you're getting all of your information from like-minded people on the internet. And it really is like a religious awakening. Talk to some of these kids. I know you know what I'm talking about if you've just been in college. Like you're reading stuff, you're like, wait, everything they're telling me is a total lie. Because it is. That is happening across this country. I meet these kids. My children are some of them. And I don't mean anything creepy, hateful, anything like that. But once you start to realize the amount of dishonesty out there, like it's over, they can't control you again. They can't control your brain, which is exactly what they're trying to do. We can control people's behavior. Societies are allowed to do that. You can't sleep in a crosswalk, not allowed. But we've never tried to control people's minds because that's the definition of totalitarianism. That's now what we're trying to do. Why are we trying to do that? Because the people in charge realize that the free exchange of information online makes it actually impossible for them to control what people think. So I spend my whole life complaining about the propaganda on these dumb TV networks we compete with, and Crush, by the way. <laughs> but the truth is, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. It doesn't matter what Stephanie Rule says in the morning or whatever the Don Lamont guy or whatever on CNN. I'm pronouncing it that way. I know it's not correct, but it makes me laugh, so that's what I'm calling him, Don Lamont. <laughs> it doesn't matter because nobody younger than me well into middle age, is ever going to see it. Because young people don't watch that stuff because it's too dumb. <laughs> they read the internet where you can say whatever you want. So it wouldn't even occur to them to believe Don Lamont, or me for that matter, I'm being honest, because they have another source. And the people in charge of deciding what the rest of us believe know this. And it scares the heck out of them. And in response, like Nikolai Ceausescu, they're freaking out and barking orders at the guards. But it's totally pointless because it's over. Their hegemony over our brains is done. Thank God. Ha! Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, Tucko Carlson, thank you for coming tonight. Enjoy your evening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>